at uh, Romans chapter 15 and uh, the passage that was read and uh, I'm afraid David uh, Meredith or Meredith as he calls himself <laughs> has um, stolen my opening line and uh, attributed it to John Cleese I'm sure John Cleese didn't come up with this it's not very profound anyway you know remember he said the other night how do you make God laugh how do you make God laugh you show him your plans and that's what Paul is doing here in this last chapter. And there's nothing more boring than other people's travel plans. I suppose they're photographs, maybe, but... Uh... <laughs> but look at verses 23 and following in Romans chapter 15. But now, Paul says, now that there's no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I've been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. He's a busy man, isn't he? He's in Corinth, and he writes this letter to the Romans. He wants to go to Spain, and he's going to go, he's going to have a stopover in Jerusalem, uh, but he's going to go to Spain and, uh, and Rome through Jerusalem. He's going to Spain, he's going to have a stopover in Rome, uh, but in order to get there, he's going through Jerusalem. Uh, that's a 3,000 mile round trip. Uh, I'm not sure if he went to the wrong travel agent. Uh, I've been to South Africa a couple of times from Australia, and to my amazement, it's cheaper by far uh, to go to uh, South Africa through London rather than to go direct. First time I went, we saved the church $1,000 just by coming in through Heathrow Airport. And it was very convenient because it meant I could have a stopover and go down and see my, my, my family down in Pembrokeshire and, uh, and then go on to South Africa. Well, is that it? Is Paul, has Paul got a cheap flight? Uh, is, he, um, is he flying Garuda? He stops off at every village in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, has he consulted the wrong travel agent? Has he got a round-the-world ticket? Well, no. So what is this all about? Yeah, Rome's in that direction. Jerusalem is in that direction. Doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Why this particular itinerary? Well, it may surprise you, or it may not surprise you, but I think that this may very well be the reason why Paul wrote Romans. In fact, I'm sure it is the reason. Do you know why Paul wrote Romans? It was because he wanted to go to Spain. That's why he wrote Romans. Why did he want to go to Spain? Well, it wasn't for the, the beaches in Barcelona. It wasn't for the museums in Madrid. It wasn't for the nightclubs in Benidorm. Why did he want to go to Spain? Because his Lord had commissioned him to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he's looking for a new field of service. He's, he's wanting to break new ground with the gospel. Look what it says there in verse 23. He says, there's no more place for me to work in this region. Verse 19, from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. That's that's, I think that's Albania. From Jerusalem all the way up to the Adriatic, all the way to those sort of Baltic countries, he says, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ, job done. It's a remarkable thing to say. What could he possibly mean by that? Obviously not everybody was converted in those regions, but he says, uh, my commission has been accomplished from Jerusalem all the way up the eastern Mediterranean to the shores of the Adriatic Sea, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. He's, 
He's evangelized the Eastern Mediterranean, and now he wants to start on the Western Mediterranean. Now he wants to evangelize the West. It's always, he says, verse 20, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. He wants to go to Spain. I, I think it's, uh, it was Francis Xavier, the founder of the Jesuits in the 17th century, who uh, famously said, uh, famously challenged a bunch of university students in his day with these words, give up your small ambitions, come with me and save the world. Not sure that the Jesuits were the right people to do that, but it's a good quote, isn't it? I think this is what Paul is saying in Rome. This is why he wrote Romans. This is what he wants to say to the church in Rome. Give up your small ambitions. Come with me and save the world. That's the message of Romans. It's, it's not a systematic theology for Bible nerds. I, I've got shelves and shelves of commentaries on Romans. I, I've hardly read any of them, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Apart from Stuart Olitz, of course. <laughs> Which is very readable and you know, it's, it's, it's concise as he is always. <laughs> but um, Romans is not a systematic theology for Bible nerds. It is an apology for worldwide evangelization. From the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, if reading Romans and studying Romans in our Bible study groups and our growth groups, if reading Romans and preaching through Romans doesn't make you and your people want to share the gospel, especially with those who've never heard it before, then you've missed the whole point of Romans. It's a, it's a sad commentary, isn't it, on, on today's church, that often those of us who call ourselves evangelicals are not evangelistic, and those who are evangelistic are often not evangelical. Think of people like Rob Bell and Steve Chalky. That's not a situation that Paul would have approved of. That's why he wrote Romans. So that the church in Rome would not sit fast and loose to the gospel. So that they might be established in the gospel. So that you might know what my gospel is and then send me out to Spain. James Denny, the um, uh, Scottish preacher said this once, he said, the church is healthiest when its evangelists are theologians and its theologians are evangelists. That's how it ought to be. And that's why Paul wrote Romans, to establish those Christians there at the heart of the empire in his gospel, so they would embrace that gospel with him and send him out with it to the Western world. He's saying, really, to those Roman Christians, give up your small ambitions. Come with me and save the world. Someone has said that uh, mission comes very low down on the agenda of most churches, most denominations. If it's there at all, it's uh, under any other business rather than matters arising. But if we're to be brutally honest about it, often it doesn't even get on the agenda at all, does it? Not even under apologies for absence. And Paul is writing this letter of, of, uh, to the Roman church so that they will put mission, God's mission to the world, on their agenda. I, I guess by now we're used to the idea that every member is a minister. I hope we are. That's just the priesthood of all believers, isn't it? Uh, but it's time, I think, we, that we need to get used to the idea that every member is a missionary. Uh, we, in, in our churches, and this is the Presbyterian culture in an old denomination, we don't uh, bring people into membership anymore. We, 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 don't, we don't call them members. We call them partners. You see, because the idea, is, and there's a lot of Presbyterians like this, they, the idea of being a member, you know, it's like being a member of the bowling club. There are certain uh, uh, advantages in joining the club and, uh, you know, certain... Uh, 
uh, uh, certain uh, rights that you have as, as a member that uh, non-members don't have and so on, voting rights and all the rest of it. So we don't bring people into membership because it conveys to the wrong idea. We, we say, no, you, we, we're taking you into partnership. That's much more biblical, isn't it? It's Philippians. It's, it's, we're partners together in gospel work. We, we're, we're partnering together. Whatever the gifts are that God has given you, as a congregation, we are partnering together to get the gospel out into the world. That's what it's all about. That's what church is. God's, it's, it's what Israel was supposed to be, God's missionary task force on mission together with God in the world. Now, what will that look like? Let me say four things about God's mission to the world. And they all begin with the letter P, I'm sorry. And so this sermon comes to you courtesy of the letter P, as they say on Sesame Street. <laughs> What, what, what will it look like if, as, as God's people, we are on mission to, it sounds a bit trendy, this, I'm sorry, <laughs> talking about being on mission together with God. I, I don't really like that phrase, but I'm, I can't think of a better way of putting it. What, will it, what, what. what will it involve us in? Being on mission together with God, bringing the gospel to the world. Well, what's it about? First, it's proclaiming, proclaiming Christ. If you look at verses 17 to 19, you'll see that. It comes out very clearly there in verse 19. From Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Mission is proclaiming Christ. Now, you may think that's pretty obvious. Maybe obvious to you. It isn't always obvious to the missionary societies. I heard, uh, I heard recently of two ministers who were turned down by a particular missionary society because they were only Bible teachers. They didn't have any other skills. And so they couldn't place them. <laughs> I know there are problems getting people into countries and visas and all the rest of it. But we mustn't forget that mission is essentially proclaiming Christ. It's proclamation. Notice the language he uses here to describe this, this activity of, of evangelizing the nations, proclaiming Christ. He uses Old Testament worship language, doesn't he? It's strange. We don't expect to find that there. He uses temple terminology. I, verse 16, I am a minister. Literally what he says there is this, I am a liturgist. That's the word. A liturgist. You know what the liturgy is, don't you? It's the order of service. I am a liturgist of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. I wonder if you've seen evangelism like that. I wonder if you've seen missionary work in that way as worship sometimes i know in, in in our circles people drive a wedge between evangelism and worship and so you 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 people you're into evangelism we're into worship as if there was some kind of you know no no the evangelism is worship i mean it's we we worship god in so many ways but evangelism is one is according to paul here is, is worship because he says proclaiming the gospel of god to the gentiles it is my priestly duty and those who are converted under my ministry, he says, they are an offering that I am bringing to God. The Gentiles are an offering that I bring. They're set apart by the Holy Spirit under my preaching, he says. And I bring them to God as an offering of worship. I wonder if we see, see that. Priestly ministry, you see, it's not wearing robes. It's not offering a sacrifice at an altar. It's not bells and smells and that sort of thing. It's proclaiming Christ. When Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper, remember he says, as often as you do this, he says, you, what do you do? You proclaim Christ. The Lord, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a vis visible gospel sermon, isn't it? It's not a priest dressed up in robes with his back to the congregation, offering up a sacrifice on the altar, representing Christ. That's what they believe, you know. That's what the mass is. Mumbo jumbo, hey presto, the bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Christ. And the priest comes and offers up, rep represents. That's so blasphemous, isn't it? Represents the sacrifice to God. They do that every Sunday morning. Some of them do it every day. No, 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 no. It's not about representing Christ. It's about representing Christ, isn't it? That's what it's about. 
We go to the world not with the sacraments. We go to the world not with bread and wine. We go to the world with the message of the once and for all finished work of Christ on the cross. As Luther put it, uh, we, 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 we go to the world with this message as though Christ died yesterday, rose again today, and is coming back tomorrow. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. That's our message. It's good news. It's the good news of the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, by which the middle wall of partition has come down, so that now in Christ there is neither Jew or Gentile. All are one in Christ Jesus. And that's the significance of the, um, that's the significance of the collection. We've just had a collection. <laughs> but the collection in the New Testament is quite different. It's mentioned in a number of different places, in Corinthians, in Acts, here in, in Romans. Paul, that's, you see, this is why Paul has to go to Jerusalem in order to go to Rome, in order to go to Spain. This is why he has to go through Jerusalem. It's because of the collection. Because he's been traveling around the Eastern Mediterranean, planting churches, and as he's been doing that, he's been taking up a collection. He's been taking up an offering from the Gentiles for the Jews in Jerusalem. Jews, Jewish believers who are suffering from persecution, suffering from famine apparently. And Paul has been, as he goes around preaching and seeing, he's been seeing Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. He's been taking up the collection. You say, well, that's deacon's work. Well, that isn't the way Paul saw it. He's been taking up the collection and now he's gonna go out of his way to Jerusalem so that he might bring that collection from the Gentiles to the Jews. We owe it to the Jews, he says. We've received so much from them, from their treasure house. We owe it, we have their scriptures, we have their Messiah, we have their God as our God. We have the covenants and the promises, we were strangers to these things. And he, as he goes around these Gentile churches, he reminds the Gentile Christians of their indebtedness to the Jewish people. And he goes up to Jerusalem with this great swag of money. Why? Well, because it's right in and of itself, of course. He goes thousands of miles out of his way to bring this money to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And why? Well, not only because why not? But because it validates his ministry. It undergirds the gospel that he's been preaching. It demonstrates what the gospel actually is all about, doesn't it? See, the biggest division in the ancient world was the Jew-Gentile division. I think we might begin to understand, if we were here next week, we'd probably begin to understand just how much of a division that is because that great, whacking great marquee that's gone up in Pentridge Jane Morgan is for Orthodox Jews. It's so that they will not necessarily be contaminated by any contact with us. We're Gentile dogs. It was a huge, serious division in the ancient world. But the gospel has broken down that division. I, mean, I actually, when I, I hadn't appreciated until just think, people were telling me this week about what happens up there, I hadn't appreciated that how much of a division it really is. I was at a conference in um, Iowa. I haven't been to the States very much, but I, I was in Ames, Iowa, uh, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a conference for people involved in kind of church planting movements. Uh, it was about church-based theological education. And there were people from all over the world, particularly, uh, you know, somebody mentioned earlier on in the week, the rapid expansion of the church in, in the global south. Uh, and it, it, that's, that's right, in places like India, China, places like that, the, the church is just expanding very, very rapidly, but it's very shallow. 
and uh, there, there are many leaders and evangelists and preachers, but they, they don't have any theological training. They can't go to a theological seminary. They can't afford to do that. It's too far away. And so this movement is trying to provide quality theological training for people without actually taking them out of their, their situation so they can get on with their ministry. And there were, there were amongst others, there were, there were two men from the Congo. Uh, they were joint leaders of a, a church planting movement of about 7,000 churches in the Congo. And they had been on opposite sides of a civil war. In fact, the one had been personally, personally responsible for the massacre of the other man's family. <laughs> and there they were in this conference, brothers in the Lord, fellow laborers. That's what the gospel does. All over the Eastern Mediterranean, that's what the gospel's been doing. From Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, right up to the shores of the Adriatic, reaching into Serbia, Albania, Macedonia, that's what has been happening. The walls have been coming down. People have been coming out of their ghettos, embracing one another in Christ. That's wonderful. Do you know, let me give you a, just a, a window into what that, what that meant then and now for that matter. It's very contemporary in a way. Is it, let me tell you what, if you look at the trade routes, but if you look at the trade maps of the time, then you'll know this about these, these cities. You see, Paul, all from Jerusalem all the way around to U, Yugoslavia, it used to be called, Paul says, I have fully proclaimed Christ. There's nothing else for me to do now. I, I've, I've done my job there. What, is, what does he mean? Well, he, obviously, what, he, he doesn't mean that he's, he's spoken to every single person who lives in those regions. What he's been doing, it, 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 he's been going to strategic population centers, if you like, towns, cities, and he's planted churches. So he planted a church in Ephesus, and that church then, uh, it, it, like a strawberry plant, has planted churches in the Lycus Valley, and there are about 11 churches in the Lycus Valley. We know some of them, Laodicea, Colossae, and so on. And... Uh, that's what's been happening. And in all those places where the gospel has taken root, the divisions have uh, the walls separating people. Uh, I've just come down. Listen, uh, this is what it was like, you see. In these Roman cities, in the, in the Roman Empire, in these great cities, there were, listen, people from Spain, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Ethiopia, Somalia, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Armenia, Ukraine, Saudi Arabia. They had contacts with Russia, India, Thailand, Burma, and the great civilizations of China. The streets of the empire's cities were even walked by the descendants of a million slaves, a million slaves that Julius Caesar had brought home from that rough northern region with its cantankerous warlike primitive people. Yes, those first Christians even probably had met a Welshman. <laughs> An ancient Briton. And as the gospel penetrated those communities, the walls came down. People came out of their ghettos. They sat around the Lord's table together, all one in Christ Jesus. Just imagine, we were thinking yesterday about what might happen. Imagine if the gospel really took hold of the city of Jerusalem, where there are so many, not all, by any means, not all the Jews live in Israel, but imagine if... Uh, if what we were thinking about yesterday started to happen, and this is speculative, I admit this, but just use your imagination for a moment. We may, I might be totally wrong about this, but just imagine, just for the sake of uh, perhaps fueling our prayers, uh, as to what might happen if the gospel were to really, if, if there was an, uh, a mass conversion of Jewish people in Jerusalem, can you think of the impact that that would have on the Middle East? You... You can have the Temple Mount. We don't want it. We don't need it. Christ is our temple. Let's share the land. Our inheritance is in heaven. We're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. That might trigger off the conversion of the Muslim world. Who knows? I mean, that's just purely speculative, isn't it? But you see, what I'm trying to say is this. That the gospel is that powerful. This is what it does. It heals the, 
the deepest, deepest divisions. It brings people together so that they're all one in Christ. So that's the first thing. World mission is proclaiming Christ. Do all other sort of things to help that happen and all other things spin out of that as well, but it's, it's essentially it's proclaiming Christ. Secondly, it's pioneering. Verse 20, to boldly go where no one has been before. To boldly go, your Star Trek friend, you Star Trek fans will uh, recognize that. To boldly go where no one has been before. What is the final frontier? Well, of course, for you Star Trek fans, uh, space is the final frontier. But back in 1768, there was a 39-year-old British sea captain who set off on one of those journeys of discovery, a scientific discovery. He was hired by the Royal Society to go and observe the transit of Venus across the sun. It was a journey that would take him into the unknown, literally into uncharted waters. Uh, when uh, he saw, eventually he saw a shoreline that reminded him of South Wales. So he called it New South Wales. Imagine what would have happened if Captain Cook had stayed at home and refused to go on that, uh, that great adventure of his. We'd probably all be uh, speaking Dutch or smoking French cigars in Australia now. This, listen to this, this line from Captain Cook's journal. This is where Star Trek got the line from. This is Captain Cook, not Captain Kirk. <laughs> He said, I had ambition not only to go farther than any man had been before, but as far as it was possible for man to go. That was his ambition. To boldly go where no one has been before. That's Paul's great ambition, isn't it? To boldly go where no one has been before with the gospel. Not because he's a, an adventurer, although I think he probably was, you know, I think Bear Grylls looks like uh, uh, Andy Pandy compared to, <laughs> compared to Paul and the things that Paul put up with and suffered and probably ate. <laughs> but not because he's a kind of Bear Grylls character or a, or a Captain Cook or a, or a Richard Branson using the gospel as an excuse for adventure and outdoor life. No, no, he has scriptural warrant for this, doesn't he? I mean... Pointless having, it's great to have ambition, but make sure your ambitions actually rest on the foundation of Scripture. And Paul's ambition comes right out of the Scriptures. He quotes there in verse 21, Isaiah 52, one of the, uh, the servant songs. Uh, and, and this is what it says there about, about Jesus, about the suf suffering servant. That Jesus came as a missionary and uh, he wants his followers to be missionaries too, to boldly go where no one has been before. So that, it says there, verse 21, those who are not told will see and those who have not heard will understand. David Livingstone, when interviewed by the London Missionary Society, was asked, where do you want to go? He said, anywhere, as long as it's forward. And when he arrived in Africa, he wrote home saying that he was haunted by the smoke of a thousand villages stretching out before him. Haunted. All those communities where there is no gospel church. All those people who don't know Christ. All those people without hope and without God in this world. It haunted him. Disturbed his sleep. Now you might think that after all these years, after so many centuries of missionary activity, there's nowhere left to go with the gospel. No longer any need to pioneer. But you'd be totally wrong. The need is ten times greater today than it was in Paul's day. There are ten times as many unreached people in the world today as there were in Paul's day. There are eight million Muslims in Europe unevangelized. One in five have never heard of Jesus. Dozens, dozens of people groups without a Bible in their own language. Whole nations without a church. That's the world we live in. 
I remember reading uh, years ago a, a story of a, an African bishop who had be, was being shown around a, a parish church somewhere in England, and the vicar said to him proudly, well, this, our church has been here for 800 years preaching the gospel. And the bishop said to him, what took you so long? What took you so long? And today, there are still people waiting. They're waiting for some of you here in this conference some of you young people, but not just the young people, those who you've taken early retirement. You've got lots of time on your hands and plenty of skills and lots to do. And there are people in the world today waiting for you to put on your gospel boots and go to them and tell them about Jesus. There are people, still people, waiting to hear the gospel for the first time. How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent. You see, sometimes churches, and especially this is happening now because of the American, I don't know if it's the same here, but in Australia, there's a lot of American influence amongst evangelicals, and the, you know, the, the, whole, the whole mega church thing is, not that we can't, we can't have mega churches in Australia, but people still try, and they, this is what they're trying to do. And the, the, the very idea of stockpiling Christians. I mean, they tried that in Jerusalem, and God soon put an end to that, didn't he? I think by the time you get to Acts chapter 8, there will be about 25 or 30,000 Christians in Jerusalem, and then God scattered them. Are you in a church, and you're building an empire, and you want a, a mega church, <laughs> and you're drawing Christians? Usually it's just people from other churches, isn't it? And they, they come because this is the latest church, this is the place to go. We've got a little motto that we use, it's not original to us, but our church, we just have three little words that sum up our mission statement, win, build, send. Win people for Christ, build them up in the faith, and then send them out. We've seen people being converted. We've, we do a lot of one-to-one -one discipleship thing, which I find very uncomfortable because I've never really uh, been on the receiving end of that as a young Christian. But it's so important. We win. We try and win people for Christ. We try and build them up. But we're very reluctant to send them out. <laughs> Especially our best people. We want to keep them, don't we? We feel so insecure sending people out. As if God was such a niggardly, penny-pinching God that, that he wouldn't give us something better. That's been, always been my experience, you know, when you give something away, God, especially when you give personnel to, 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 for the gospel, when you give people away, God makes it up to you. More than makes it up to you. Let me bring it a little bit closer to home even. How, how many non-Christian friends do you have? See, most of us spend most of our time with those who already know the gospel, don't we? Especially ministers, it's an occupational hazard. <laughs> uh, I remember reading the story of um, the pastor, a young pastor who received two phone calls one night, one after the other. The two men in his town, two men dying. One had been rushed to a hospital one side of town and the other was already in hospital 30 minutes in the other direction. One was an elder of the church. The other was a God-denying man, well known in the community for his dislike of the church and everything it stood for. Both are calling for the pastor. And the two hospitals are in the opposite direction. And the pastor has to decide who he's going to go to. What did he do? Well, he prayed, of course. And then he hurried to the bedside of the unsaved sinner. As it turned out, the tough old sinner repented and put his trust in Jesus and died a few years later, reconciled to God, forgiven. The elder, of course, recovered. They always do. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit cynical. <laughs> that's a bit cynical. <laughs> The elder recovered and left the church. Of course, he and his family furious because the pastor had not come immediately to visit him. See, it's not an academic question. To boldly get, go where no one has been before. It's a question that confronts us every day, not just those of us who are in ministry. To boldly go. C.T. Studd says, why should anyone have the opportunity to reject the gospel twice when so many have not had the opportunity to hear it once? I'm not sure about the logic of that, but I think he's got a point. 
Who are the unreached people in Aberystwyth? They're here. Now, I don't mean they're here in this hall, but in any community, there are people who would never darken the door of a church. I mean, we're middle class, tertiary educated mainly in evangelical churches, aren't we? Where are the street kids? Where are the uh, professional jet setters? Where are the, we had, we're having this same sex marriage debate in Australia at the moment and uh, we're having these public meetings where we're trying to sort of put the Christian position and, and uh, all these meetings are being picketed by the gay community and uh, it's a very volatile sort of debate that's going on at the moment. I wonder if Paul would have planted a church in a gay nightclub. Do you know, I think he probably would have. Uh, it's pretty shocking, isn't it? Who are the people we're not reaching? Who are the people who are, who are not hearing about Jesus? Where are they? I remember at, uh, at a proclamation trust conference, and first, I think it was the first time I ever heard Philip Jensen, who's now the Dean of Sydney. Uh, he was telling us about the, the, the church planting that uh, was happening at St. Math Matthias there in Sydney. And uh, one of the things he told us about was this, one of the church plants, it, uh, it was a church plant that happened at two o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Two o'clock in the morning in Sydney, they held church. Hmm, it wasn't the Sabbath, was it? Yeah, but the people they were trying to reach would never have come to church on the Sabbath. They were Chinese restaurant workers. And the only time they had free was two o'clock after their shift on a Tuesday morning. And so uh, they planted a church amongst Chinese restaurant workers. You see, we've got to think like this. Where to next with the gospel? Who are the people who haven't heard? How can we reach them? That's what our session meetings, our elders meetings, our planning meetings should be. Uh, uh, that's what should be on our agenda. That's why Paul wrote Romans to put it on the agenda. It means praying about who you're going to sit next to on the bus. Actually, it means deciding or not whether you're going to take the bus into town or whether you're going to drive your own car. I deliberately decided that uh, I have an office in town and, and uh, rather than drive in I, I take the bus in because every day I, I, I spend 20 minutes on that bus uh, driving uh, going into town with a busload of passengers most of whom are not Christians and I must admit I haven't yet had seen any kind of a breakthrough but uh, at least I'm on a bus with passengers uh, most of whom are not Christians they you see it's not we're not talking about going to uh, some remote place. I'm just talking about what happens in your life every day. To boldly go where no one's been before. Our, our, our church leaders need to think about setting their people free so they're not in church all the time. So they've got, they've got the time to make friends with non-Christians and share their Christian friends with their non-Christian friends. Yes, there are risks. That's why I said boldly go where no one's been before. So it's proclaiming and it's pioneering. We need to be pioneers. It's partnering. That's the third one. Look at verse 24. You see, why, why Rome on the way to Spain? Why doesn't he get a direct flight from Jerusalem to Spain? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Look what he says in verse 24. He says, um, I, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Now, to have you assist me on my journey, he's not just asking for a bed for the night. He's a, you know, he's, he must be one of the most misrepresented characters in all history, Paul. So many people have this idea of him as the, you know, the, this driven man who's such a, a towering intellect and he's, he's a loner. 
That's how people think of him. F.F. F. Bruce says he was, there, was about a, there must be at least 100 names in the New Testament of people who sort of traveled around with Paul. At any one time, he might have 30 people traveling around with him. And he says, he says I'm looking forward to visit you as I pass through, he says, and uh, to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company. He's looking forward to catching up with people in Rome. Uh, he's never been to Rome before. He, doesn't, he knows of some of those people because he's come across them elsewhere. Aquila and Priscilla are there in Rome at the moment. If you read chapter 16, you'll recognize some of the names. He's been praying about some of these people. He's been receiving news about these people. And he said, I'm really looking ca- forward to catching up uh, with you when I get to Rome and enjoying your company. But he says, Let me, uh, let's not be beat about the bush here. Let's not uh, you know, pretend the reason I'm coming to Rome is not just to enjoy your company, it's to plunder your church. <laughs> I'm coming to recruit a team. I want you to be the new Antioch in Rome. I want to build a base for the evangelization of the Western world. I want you to assist me on my journey to Spain. It's a technical term. Let me show you. Titus chapter 3. And um, verse, tw- uh, verse 12, at the end of that letter to Titus, as soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, he says, do your best to come to me at Nic- Nicopolis, because I've decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way, and see that they have everything they need. See, this is how it happened. There was no central fund. Zenos and Apollos, they're not freeloaders. They're gospel workers. And Paul lays it on the conscience of Titus to say, make sure you help them on their way. See that they have everything they need. Help them on their way. I'm coming to Rome. I want you to help me on my way. Or or, or that lovely little letter of 3 John. Look what he says there in 3 John verse 6. He says, Uh, To Gaius, he's writing to Gaius, he says, they've told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a a manner worthy of God. Who are they? They're gospel workers. They're not spiritual tourists. There's a lot of that sort of thing happening, isn't there? We've got to go to America because we want to go to Driscoll's church and experience that. (laughs) Pathetic, isn't it? Just spiritual tourism, that's all it is. Sightseeing. <laughs> Who are these people that John is talking about here? Help them on their way, he says. Send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. He says, it was for the sake of the name that they went out. Receiving no help from the pagans, we ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. Who are they? they? They went out for the sake of the name, to make the name known. The name which is above every name. The name which no Jew would speak out loud. The priests would change their clothes every time they wrote it down. The name above every name, the name that has now been given to Jesus, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That's who these people are. They're gospel workers. They're going out into the world for the sake of the name. And you've done well, he says to Gaius, to help them. Gaius is a picture of spiritual health, isn't he? I love the, 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 you remember the opening words? He says to my dear friend, I says, I pray that you may enjoy good health, that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. Just imagine if, if uh, God were to answer that prayer for us. We'd be, it'd be like a graveyard, yeah, wouldn't it? We'd be like zombies if we, were as spiritually, if, we were as, if we were as physically healthy as we are spiritually healthy. We'd be in trouble, I think, many of us. But Gaius, he was a healthy Christian. He had a, and he was a healthy Christian because he had more than a polite interest in worldwide evangelization. He had more than a polite interest in world mission. He was committed to it financially. He was committed to it prayerfully. He helped these men on their way, unlike Diotrephes. <laughs> Remember Diotrephes? He, he was the, the guy who ruled the roost there in the church. He loved to have the preeminence. There's one in every congregation. He's a, a pillar of the church. 
You know uh, the definition of a pillar? Something that obstructs vision and holds things up. <laughs> Have you got a Diotrephes in your church? <laughs> Are you a Diotrephes? I don't know how many churches have been ruined by power brokers who hold the reins and rule the roost and won't allow anything to happen unless they've got their fingerprints on it. Are you a Diotrephes or are you a Gaius? What are you? Are you a help or are you a hindrance to the evangelization of the world? Remember the film Schindler's List? It's a great film, in black and white, apart from that one scene, or one character, if I remember rightly. <laughs> it's a story, isn't it, of the, the, the Oscar Schindler, the um, opportunist. He was a, a profiteer. He uh, had a, a factory he, uh, for pots and pans in, the, in, in Poland when the war began, and uh, he saw uh, the opportunity of, of getting cheap slave labor, really. And uh, so he had lots of Jewish people working in his factory. But as the war dragged on, he began to get convicted about it, and he realized what was happening, what was taking place. And uh, he started to use his own wealth to bribe Nazi officials and army officers to give him more and more Jews to work in his factory, which by then had become a munitions factory. It was the most unproductive munitions factory in the whole of uh, Nazi Germany. It virtually bankrupted him personally. But during that time, he saved over 1,200 Jews from certain death in the gas chambers. And then there's that moment right at the very end of the film, isn't it? It's very, I'm not sure if this is just uh, Spielberg or putting a spin on things, but it's very moving when you watch the film. Right at the very end, you know, uh, the war is over and the Allies are approaching, and Schindler realizes that he's going to be in trouble. They'll think that he's a collaborator. And. Uh, just at the very end of the film, these people surround him, these people who he's rescued. They come with their letters of recommendation to the Allies, telling the story of how they've been helped by this man. And he breaks down. And he says, I could have done so much more. And he points to his old sort of battered Mercedes, I could have sold that. I could have saved 10 people right there. And he plucks out the gold pin from his lapel. He says, this is solid gold. There's another two people there I could have saved. And he breaks down. He said, I could have done so much more. So much more. On that great day when we appear before the great white throne. Is that what we're going to say? Lord, I could have done so much more. All those denominational committees I've been on. <laughs> so many minutes kept and hours wasted. <laughs> All that money tied up in trust funds and in buildings that are no longer occupied. Why didn't we do something about that? Why didn't we use those resources to reach people? For Christ. Why did I need two cars? Why did I need that overseas holiday? Why do I need five bathrooms? Why do I need to put an extension on my... Why do I... I could have done so much more. So much more. So Paul... That's what Paul means, you see, when he says, you know, it sounds very innocent, doesn't it? I'm, I'm on my way to Spain, I'm going to have a stopover in Rome, and I'd love to catch up with you, and I want you to help me on my journey. Sounds so innocent, doesn't it? But it's, he's going to plunder the church. He's going to take their best workers. They're all there in Romans chapter 16, hard workers, risk takers. He said, I'm going to pick them, and I want your financial help as well, and, and I want Rome now to become, look at verse 14, you see, I, I'm convinced, he says, brothers, that you yourself are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, competent to instruct one another. One of the reasons that the church in Rome is so healthy is because he's written Romans to them and he's been building a base. He says, now I want to come to Rome and I want to use you as the base. 
Just as Antioch sent out Paul and Barnabas around the eastern Mediterranean, now he wants Rome to send him out with the team to Spain so that he can evangelize the Western world. He wants them to partner with him. So the question for us, you see, is this. Will I go? Or shall I stay? And if I stay, then it must be to pay and it must be to pray. Again, if you, pardon me, mentioning Philip Jensen again, he's been such a, a, a huge influence on evangelical Christianity around the world, but in Australia. He's a very courageous man. Uh, we, we have something, but we, we, call, we could call it a, the ministry training strategy. It's, it came out of Sydney. But rather than reinvent the wheel, we, we run a conference in, in Tasmania. Same thing. It's the, the idea is to challenge people, to, to try and recruit people for ministry. Not that we want to um, put people or push people into ministry. It has to be the call of God, and that call has to be tested by the church. But it's, it's, a, it's challenging people, and, and people come along, and they, they're challenged under the preaching of the word to think about what they should do with the rest of their lives. It's, it is, in one sense, cynically, you could say, uh, an exercise in career diversion. Although it takes two or three years before someone actually moves into a theological college and then, so it's, it's giving people time to think through the issues and they're put into a mentoring relationship and so on. And, but at one of these conferences, I, I can remember a man coming up afterwards and saying that uh, he, he, he was really challenged under the preaching, but he, he really felt that uh, he would do more good if he were to stay at home as a doctor or uh, I think he was a doctor, he was training to be a doctor and that he would earn a lot of money, a lot more money as a doctor and he would support missions and support ministers and he said, I think I could be, serve the kingdom better and of course you can because we need the gift of uh, generosity, that's one of the gifts, isn't it? But Jensen, I think, read the man's heart and he said to him, well, that's all right, if, if that's what the Lord wants you to do, he says, but make sure, you know, that when you do that, you live on an MTS apprentice's salary and you give the rest of the money to the mission. Didn't want the man to wriggle off the hook, you see. It's a serious, que it's, it's a serious question. For, we, if you haven't faced the question yet, you must. Shall I go? Where to next, Lord, with the gospel? Shall I go? And if I don't go, if I stay, then it must be to pay. And it must be to pray. And that leads me to the last point. It's proclaiming, it's pioneering, it's partnering, and of course it's praying. It's praying. I urge you, look at verse 30, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Prayer is a struggle, isn't it? I, I struggle. Uh, it's hard work. It doesn't come naturally to us to pray, does it? Um, I know it's a bit of a, a cliche, but uh, I'm, I'm always saying to our people, um, don't pray for the work. Prayer is the work. Prayer is the work. Oh, people say, well, about the prayer. I'm trying, always trying to encourage our, our new churches to have prayer meetings, congregational prayer meetings. And they say, oh, the prayer meeting, well, I, I don't get anything out of it. Who said you're supposed to get anything out of it? You're supposed to put something into it. It's work. It's hard work. Remember those three old codgers up on the hill in Exodus chapter 17? Aaron and Hur holding up Moses' hands while Joshua, you know, the young Turk, is fighting a battle down there on the plain. And, and we're told, aren't we, that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Why is it always the old codgers? I'm one myself now. Not quite an octogenarian. <laughs> you know, it's the octogenarians like Aaron and Hur and Moses who are at the prayer meeting. The young Turks are swapping recipes on Facebook. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? I'm becoming a grumpy old man, but <laughs> it's true. They're soft. What is this thing, this obsession with cooking? I'm, I'm obsessed about eating it, but not all these recipes that keep appearing, all these cooking shows on the telly. Anyway, that's off the subject. <laughs> Paul says, join me in my struggle 
by prayer, by praying to God for me. It's, oh, but it's so uncool to go to the prayer meeting. Get over it. I think it was Samuel Nesdely. I, I, not sure if this is where I saw this. He, uh, there's that little paperback amongst the Soviet evangelicals where uh, I think it was him. He revisited the, uh, a big Baptist church in Moscow. He'd uh, known the church during the Cold War and uh, after the, uh, the walls had come down, he revisited this church in, in Moscow and uh, uh, he was talking to the pastor. He said, who are those ladies up there, those women? There was a row, well, a row after row of women dressed in sort of widow's black sitting there in the congregation, this vast congregation. He said, who are those women there sitting in black? Ah, said the pastor, those are the women who prayed communism out of Russia. The little old babushkas, there they were. They didn't have Kalashnikov rifles, they had Bibles. And they prayed communism out of Russia. That's cool. They weren't swapping recipes. They were praying, they were struggling in prayer. Join with me in my struggle, Paul says. That's where the real work happens. Nothing will happen otherwise. If you're a pastor, if you're a minister, and, and you, you, you're in a, perhaps you're a young guy who's gone into ministry for the first time and you've got all these ideas, no, nothing's gonna happen. Nothing at all will happen unless you call your people to pray, to join you within the, the struggle in, by praying for you. I, I was on the way down, I, I caught up with an old friend in London, Winston Saunders, some of you will know him, and he was telling me about uh, uh, something that um, happened to Westminster Chapel where the doctor was, um, the doctor always used to attend the prayer meeting. There were prayer meetings at Westminster Chapel and often before the services and the doctor would always attend the prayer meetings and on one occasion he was in a prayer meeting apparently and they were praying and, and so on and uh, the doctor said to them, don't you appreciate my ministry? And the guy who was leading the prayer meeting said, well of course we do doctor. He said, well why don't you pray for me? And he said, well, Surely, doctor, you don't need our prayers. The doctor said, you don't know me. You don't know me. Join with me in my struggle, Paul says, by praying to God for me. It's interesting, you know, those who know how to pray will be most solicitous of other people's prayers. They'll beg other people to pray for them. That's what Paul's doing here. Like William Carey, when William Carey went to India, with the gospel, he wrote home to his friend Andrew Fuller. He said, I, I'm going into the pit, but you must hold the rope. Is your church prayer meeting holding a rope? Or are you just taking a polite interest in some poor missionary who's sold up everything and gone off to the ends of the earth and you get a, an email every now and again from them perhaps? Who's holding the rope? Do you pray for your pastor? Do you pray for your preacher? Or do you just complain about him? Well, did God answer Paul's prayers? Look, look at his prayer request there in verse 31. We nearly finished. Verse 31. He, he prays, he says, that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. He prays for three things, doesn't he? Rescue from my enemies, that the collection, the offering might be accepted by the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem, and so that I may come to you. Did God answer his prayers? Yes, he did, but not quite in the way he was expecting. If you read Acts, you read those chapters in, was it chapter 21 and following, in Acts right down to chapter 27, they played past the parcel with him, didn't they? He went up to Jerusalem with this big swag of money and then he suddenly realized that somebody had taken out a contract on his life and his nephew got to hear about it and so uh, he sort of appealed to his Roman citizenship and he went from Festus, Felix, Felix Agrippa, they played pass the parcel with him. Nobody really wanted to, uh, to have him. Did God answer his prayer? Did he eventually come to Rome? Yes, but it wasn't business class on Emirates. Not that I travel by a business class, by the way. <laughs> wasn't even cattle class on Emirates. How did he come to Rome? It was through trials and court appearances and shipwreck and snake bite, in chains, all expenses, ticket paid for by the Emperor Nero. That's where we find him in, that's the last view we have of him in Acts chapter 28, he's sitting in his house in Rome, teaching about Jesus and preaching 
about the kingdom of God. See, God always answers prayer, but not always in the way you might expect. And perhaps that's why we don't pray, because we're a bit afraid of what he might do, because he's, he's not a tame lion, you know. <laughs> we're afraid, perhaps, you know, especially to pray about the big things, the kingdom-centered things, because he just might actually make you the answer to your own prayers. Or he might, he might make your children or your grandchildren go to some part of the world that you've, so you'll never see them again, except on Skype. He's not a tame lion. But, I mean, what do you, do you want a tame lion? <laughs> do you want a boringly predictable God? Do you want some God who's at your beck and call and you make your plans and you show him your plans and he just rubber stamps it? Is that what you want? Is, but he won't find him because he doesn't exist. Do you want a boringly predictable God? Or do you want a sovereignly interesting God who does all things according to his will? That's good to plan. It's great to have ambition. But our plans and our ambitions must always be subject to the will of God. Did he get to Spain? I don't know whether he got to Spain. Nobody really knows whether he got to Spain. But the last we see of him is that he's preaching the kingdom of God boldly there in Rome without, without hindrance. I mean, the gospel is without hindrance. He might have been in chains, he might have been under house arrest, but the gospel isn't. The gospel can get anywhere, like we saw the other day in Korea. So to sum it up and to conclude, Paul has a priestly ministry, which is to proclaim Christ to the nations, to bring the Gentiles as a, an offering to the God of Israel to see them converted, set apart by the Holy Spirit. He worships God by preaching the gospel, by proclaiming Christ to the nations. Paul has a pioneer ministry, breaking new ground, boldly going where no one's been before. And there's an urgent need for us to do that. See, one of the things that's changed, people say, have you, have you noticed any changes? One of the things uh, we've noticed that that's here now, not so much in Wales, it seems, but in England, which wasn't here when we, when we used to live here, are these gospel partnerships that are springing up, where people are coming together in order to train new leaders and evangelize their areas. And ask, they're asking the question, where to next? It's a pioneer ministry, and we need to help one another to do that, to break new ground. I, I just feel that we're, we're very stale and stagnant. The, the, situation, the, the situation seems to be very stagnant. We need to break new ground. We need to help one another to do that. We need to call on God to help us. Where to next with the gospel? And it's a perilous ministry fraught with danger. There's always going to be fierce opposition. Whenever there is a gospel advance, the Pharisees come out of the woodwork. <laughs> You'll find that in any church. Whenever there is conversions, I, be careful how I say this, but our church planting work, is, is, it's, come out, it's a movement of the Holy Spirit. It's an answer to prayer. It's nothing other than that. It came out of a prayer meeting. It was birthed in a prayer meeting. And you know, the people who were praying so fervently for conversions, when their prayers were answered, they were the people who had the most difficulty accepting the new converts into the church. Whenever there's a gospel advance, the Pharisees, the Pharisee in us, there's a Pharisee in all of us. Well, they're not like us, they're not Presbyterian. It's a perilous ministry. It's fraught with danger. There will be fierce opposition. And so we need to pray as never before. There's an urgent need for extraordinary prayer. For the nations to be brought in and for the Jews to be converted. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our apostle the great apostle to the Gentiles. Thank you for the heartbeat that we have felt in this passage. Thank you for Paul's 
plans and dreams that he shares with us here. Always subject to your spirit and to your word. Lord, make us people like that. Lord, give us the, to see the bigger picture. Help us to see over our fences to what you're doing in the world. Lord, we pray indeed that we may hear that message that Paul is writing to the church at Rome in our churches. Give up your small ambitions. Come with me and save the world. Amen. Amen.